a good morning or I guess afternoon or evening, depending on uh, where you're coming from, everyone today. Welcome to the third of the live streams that we're doing in Quick Wins in Cloud Compliance. If you would take a minute to say hello to us in the comments and whatever platform you're using to watch us, I always just like to know where people are coming from. And you know, to tell you the truth, my mom is going to ask me later on today, hey, how many people did you have on the stream today? And, and where were they? And so if you'll just say hi to me or say hi to my mom, I guess, if you want to, and uh, uh, let me know where you're coming from, that would be awesome. So. My name is Clay Reisenhoover. I'm the author of a class for SANS called SEC 557. And for the past few weeks, we've been doing these live streams where we talk about some really quick wins that I can get as a compliance professional on various cloud computing platforms. You know, the idea is whether the organization is new to cloud or maybe you're new to cloud or you've just parachuted into a new environment and you're trying to figure out what's going on, what are the things that we can do to very quickly get a handle on uh, the status of the organization and to understand the, the really important things that we should be doing in compliance? So to help me out with that today, I've got Kat here, and I'm going to give Kat just a minute to introduce herself, and then we will uh, jump in and start talking about things that we're interested in related to compliance with Google Cloud. So Kat, say hello to everyone. Hey team, uh, thanks for having me, Clay. This has been a blast collaborating with you on this. Uh, my name is Kat Traxler. I'm the lead author of the SEC 549 Enterprise Cloud Security Architecture course from SANS. Currently, um, it's being offered as a two-day, but I'm I'm working hard and, and trying to expand that into a five-day offering for everybody. Um, in my day job, I work on AWS and Google Cloud Kubernetes, working on threat detection. Um, so I spend a lot of time, time researching attacks thinking about how they show up in the cloud and thinking about the best ways that um, we can identify them along the control plane. Um, and then in past lives, of course, I've had experience working with enterprise architecture, building out platforms on the various cloud providers, um, doing some auditing, some penetration testing in the cloud, um, and then working on secure configuration guidelines. Great. Uh, and I've got to say, Kat has been a lot of fun to work with on this. When I when I came to her and said what I wanted to talk about, she's like, okay, great. Here's like three dozen resources that, that we can use when we're talking. She's given me just really an amazing amount of information. And, uh, you know, my background is originally as a developer, but then uh, about 20 years ago, I became an IT auditor. And since then, I've done a lot of audit and compliance work. And uh, I'd like to help organizations really understand what they need to be doing in this area. Now, we've got some resources for you today. In fact, we've got so many different web links that we've stood up a little web page that you can use to get those. So we'll be dropping that link in the comments of your stream if we haven't done it quite yet. And that's the page that you can actually see on, uh, on my screen here. So everything that we talk about today, we've given you, I think, two or three dozen different web resources today. And then we tend to do a few technical demos during these streams as well. And so anything that I do in a demo today, I'm gonna to give you the, the code for that as well. So like we've done with a lot of these other streams, what I wanna do is start by talking a little bit about the environment that we're gonna be talking about today, Google Cloud, and some of the resources that we have available for us. And a lot of times when we're looking at clouds, we kind of start with shared responsibility models and with the adoption frameworks. So Kat, I've got a, a picture up here from the Google Cloud adoption framework. And you know, a lot of times I look at these frameworks and I think, wow, this is a really nice slick brochure for which service I need to, to enable at what time in my cloud journey. But it kind of feels a little bit more like marketing material. But you know, as you and I have discussed, maybe that's not quite so much the case with, uh, with this Google adoption model. Tell us what we're looking at here and, and what do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, what we're, what we're looking at here is um, a snapshot from the Google's cloud adoption framework. And every one of the clouds that you work with, with is going to have a CAF, a cloud adoption framework. Um, and what Google's done is they've bucketed their um, 
um, their levels of maturity into three diff four different categories. The learn category, the lean category, the lead category, the scale, and the secure category. What this is not is this is not prescriptive advice, right? This is not like half the, the cloud adoption framework um, from Google or for any cloud is not a document that you can, you know, email over to your ops team and say, hey, go implement this, right? Because what you're going to get out of the CAF is a description of what an environment looks like, both from people, process, and technology, a description of what an environment looks like if it's operating at, say, the tactical level, right? We're just dipping our toes in the water, that tactical level, we're trying to get the most out of the cloud without upending processes. If you're operating more at the strategic level, maybe you're starting to optimize for scale, you're starting to get the most benefit from cloud, or you've really moved towards that transformational maturity level. And so they have this matrix where the buckets are learn, lead, scale, and secure. And then three different maturity levels. Um, and you can take this into your environment and not use it as an implementation guide, but rather use it as a conversation starter. You know, take it to that, um, you know, that meeting with all of your stakeholders and say, let's try to agree at, of where we are on the secure level, because they'll provide you, Google will provide you with a description of what does an environment look like when they are operating at the tactical level in the secure bucket. And there'll be this description of say, you know, they are maybe using primitive roles, right? Maybe they're relying on um, outside consultants for their, um, to design their um, security controls. And so you take this document and you bring it into your, all your stakeholders and say, let's agree on where we're at in each one of these buckets. And that's a huge win right there is that if you can get all of these cross-functional folks in a room and say, where are we even at? Then we can say, well, where do we want to go? And you can start designing work streams. And that's what these, these CAFs are really about. They're really more... Um, stakes in the ground to start your conversation about your maturity level and how, where do you want to go in the cloud? That is one of the things that I, that I really like here is that we've got a bit of a maturity model built into the adoption framework with this one. And as an auditor, as a compliance person, I'm always thinking about the, the maturity level of the organization that I'm dealing with. And it's kind of nice to have these two, um, you know, really overlaid here. Now, the next thing that we usually talk about then would be shared responsibility models. And uh, we, again, we see sort of the same thing in all of the shared responsibility models. And usually it's that we've got some sort of color coding. Let me see if I can draw on my screen here. So we've got something like, you know, for, for on-prem, everything is the responsibility of the, of the client or the customer organization for something like software as a service, then more of that's going to belong to the provider. And these are helpful. They do help me to understand as a customer what I should really be doing here. But I think one of my big complaints with shared responsibility models is that we're just kind of defining the wall that we're going to throw the pig over. And now it's, you know, your problem on, on the other side, rather than really telling me as the customer what I need to, to do there. But Google has added a little bit of a thought to their shared responsibility model. And so, uh, Kat, I'll kind of pull that up on the screen here. If you want to talk about the, the rest of the model. I love your analogy of throwing a, a pig over a wall. I, I tend to think of the shared responsibility model as if you remember, you know, working in offices and, you know, having the, the office partitions, you know, and just throwing it over the office partition. Yeah. Um, and that's what the shared responsibility model sort of morphed into. I think it originally, the shared responsibility model, when cloud first came out 10, 15 years ago, it was really helpful to understand 
you know, who did what. Um, but, you know, with all models, they're all, they're all broken in some way, but some are useful. And, and, and it was helpful to know, well, you know, um, what, what part of the bargain does your cloud provider need to hold up? They need to secure the operating system or do they need to provide um, secure hardware? Um, but what happened over time is it created a barrier between the customer and the cloud provider to where the cloud provider is in the best position to inform the customer of what good looks like, what secure looks like, to provide them tools to secure their environment. But that shared responsibility model acted like a wall in some cases to where, you know, why would they do something that would inform the other side of the wall? Um, so Google has been touting for several years now this idea of shared fate. And this is the, the part of the webcast where I'm gonna try really hard not to sound like a Google fangirl. Um, but I, I, do, I, do love, I do love this concept. Um, it's not, shared fate isn't a, um, a graphic that can be displayed. Um, it's not a technology or a system, but it's really more of a philosophy that they try to um, kind of sow throughout Google Cloud that says that Google Cloud has skin in the game. They have skin in the game with how your side of the responsibility model is secured. Um, so how does that show up, right? Um, I think it shows up with the suite of tools that they offer their customers. Um, you know, we're gonna go over a few of those. We're gonna go over policy analyzer. We're gonna go over cloud asset inventory. Um, they also offer um, a product that's in preview right now, risk manager that helps you connect with um, cyber insurance. Um, also some tools around um, data management and, and gaining visibility into your data around data catalog. So there's this whole collection of tools that they offer their customer just to help them secure their side of the wall. Um, but they also have some really opinionated ways on how you should do Google Cloud. And they provide those to their customers in the form of um, Terraform modules. They call them blueprints. Blueprints are landing zones um, that you as a customer can, can pick off the shelf and deploy and kind of have this pre um, pre pre cleared path for deploying applications depending on your situation. Um, and then I think another couple ways this whole shared fate shows up um, is there, you know, it's a self serving um, reason, but they've productized a lot of their own internal security tooling, right? So 10 years ago, they were doing zero trust and they operationalized it within Google and they made it work. And then they've productized that and made that as a product called Beyond Corp, which is now offered to their customers. Um, so this productizing and making available security tools, you know, lowering the barrier of entry, um, making really opinionated, um, deployable configurations, and then also providing this kind of suite of tools to help you secure your environment is all kind of wrapped in that shared fate. This, not only do they care, but it's it's part of their part of their business how you configure your environment. Yeah, and I think that that's a you know a really interesting concept, and that's one that I've just openly stolen as I'm working with some of my uh, some of my customers as as they deal even maybe with internal service providers that we really do need to understand you know this idea of shared fate. So that's one of those things that I, I really wanted us to highlight today because I think it's an important thing for us to understand. But you know I'm I'm an auditor and I'm getting itchy. I feel like I need to go out and start measuring some some things now. You know we've been talking for 15 minutes and I haven't run a command yet. So I do want to talk to you a little bit about, you know, some of the tools that are available for us to, to just do some of that basic 
information gathering. And uh, if you attended the last couple of these live streams, you know that we've got a bit of a roadmap that we use in SEC 557. And it's, it's really in three phases. It's not really a maturity model so much as a, if you haven't done any compliance work before, do this first and then do phase two second and then do the, the third phase stuff last. And in that very first phase, we, we think a lot about visibility. You know, if you look at the critical security controls, control one is that I have to understand the inventory in the organization that I'm working in. And so we've got a couple of different things that I want to want to talk about with regards to that. And one of those is this asset inventory tool that Google has given us. You would think that this would be a really obvious thing to do in all providers, but the, the way that I gather inventory can be a little bit different depending on the provider that I'm working with. And Google seems to have designed something for, for people like me to use in asset inventory. So as part of the IAM and admin section of the dashboard here, I've got this asset inventory tool. And at its very basic, it really just allows me to look at things like resources or uh, IAM policies that have been applied on those resources in the environment. So if I simply just click on resource here, I get a list of everything that's in the environment that I'm looking at. Now, in my case here, I'm looking at a project but there certainly are other organizational structures that uh, that we could use. And in fact, I, uh, I really had asked Kat to talk about this and then kind of forgot to bring it up. So let's just talk about it right now. How do I organize my, my enterprise in Google Cloud, Kat? That's a, that's, a, that's a pretty loaded question, Clay. How do you organize it? Well, <laughs> Um, I can tell you about the building blocks available to you, right? So um, Google Cloud is organized hierarchically, unlike AWS, which is a flat structure. And AWS is sort of shoehorned in some concepts of a hierarchy with the advent of AWS organizations, but it's not a real true hierarchy in that, you know, you have this policy inheritance model, and then you have the parent-child relationship between resources and the ownership. So as you can see at the top, we have that organizational node. Um, and then um, underneath that organizational node, you can have um, you know, many different folders. And these are just you know, places for you to organize your projects. Um, as you can see here, it's a, it's a fairly, fairly vertical um, organizational structure and that we have maybe only two or three depths of folders. Um, and then we have a couple of projects underneath there with some resources hanging out. Um, these are the, the four building blocks, your org, your folder, your projects equivalent to an AWS account or an Azure subscription. And then we have your resources that kind of funnel in under your projects. Um, the properties of, that, of this hierarchy is that um, um, all of the permissions um, have an inheritance model. So something that you apply at the top flows down um, to a direct descendants. And then you also have that um, parent-child relationship for ownership. So if you were to delete a folder, all of, the, all of the projects and resources under that folder would also be deleted. Given those two properties, that's how you're gonna inform how you create your organizational structure. Do you have it mimic your, your products, you know, where you have a folder per product? Do you have it mimic your internal on-prem organizational structure? Uh, that's going to depend. Um, you're going to have to mock up a few um, organization, organizational hierarchies to see how that looks to you. Okay, and we're going to be working way down at the bottom of this today. So I've set up a, a sample project over the last few days, and I've added just a few resources to it so that uh, so that I can take a look at these. So I've set in my asset inventory the the scope to this project that I've added here. And that's really what I'm looking at now is all of the resources that exist inside that particular project. And I, I think I've got a little over 100. Yeah, 118 resources in this one. Now, 
this is really one of the first steps that I'll take as an auditor or as a compliance person in the environment is just grab this inventory. I really want to understand what's going on here. So certainly I could download the CSV here. I've got a nice snapshot of, of what the resources look like at this point. But one of the things that I really like about asset inventory is that this data is saved in a time series database, which means I not only know what the inventory looks like right now as we're speaking, but I've got 35 days or five weeks worth of back information available in here as well. So if you wanted to see, hey, what's been going on in the environment, you can filter for things that include those dates and times. So if I were to look for things that were created, Sorry, nothing wants to click where I want it to right now. Let's see if I can. There we go. So let's look at maybe a create time after, well, just a couple of days ago. I've been building this environment up right now. And as this one applies, oh, I've got a lot fewer resources showing up here now. And I can see that in the last... There we go. That in the last few days, well, it looks like we've created some firewall rules. We've added some routes. We've got disks and compute instances that have been stood up, subnets that have been stood up. And this is just a, a boon for me as an auditor, as a compliance person. You know, back in the old, old days when I walked around and we had physical hardware in, in data centers and people would point at things and say, you know, that's my exchange server or that's my SQL server. It was kind of easy to answer the question, well, what's changed since the last time we looked at the environment? But that's really difficult in a world where we're using infrastructure as code, where things can be created and destroyed so quickly that I never even knew that they were there. This is, is really quite nice for me. And I really like this idea of uh, time-based data as a way to, to see what's happening in the environment. And I'll tell yeah, you, Clay, I feel like you're ready to say something. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was just, you know, when asset inventory came out, I think 2019, it was um, a gift from the gods. The um, prior to this, um, what assessments looked like in Google Cloud was a collection of Python scripts that just went and enumerated out all of the possible resources enumerated out all of their policy bindings and dumped them to a bunch of C CSVs. So um, when asset inventory came out, um, you know, it always is a good day when you can just trash a bunch of buggy Python code, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you would have been doing this, you know, per resource, let's go out and find all the storage buckets and, and save that somewhere. Let's go out and find all the compute instances and save that somewhere. Very brittle. Uh, what if a new resource type gets added? Now you've got to write code to be able to, to track that. Yeah, it's th this is a horrible way to live. It really is. And so it's so nice that we've got something available to us in the console and really not just in the console. Hey, while I'm at the uh, command line here, let's just go ahead and take a look at this. I've pre-populated a few things here. I've, I've connected to the, the Google Cloud CLI. And I've set up my project name in a variable so I don't have to keep typing it here. So I can get the same information now from the CLI that I can get from the, uh, from the web console. Now this is gonna give me a list of that whole pile of 118 assets that I was looking at in the console now here at my, uh, at my CLI. Now this is in YAML format. I'm a JSON guy because I work a lot with PowerShell. And so the first thing that I want to do then would be let's just convert that to JSON. And that's really just as simple as telling it what format I want here. So I'm gonna tell it that I would like that as JSON data. And then that allows me to start doing the sort of PowerShell type things that I would do with this. So now as I'm gathering this asset inventory, I'm going to take that data, I'm going to convert it into a PowerShell object, and then I can do any of those things that PowerShell would let me do with the objects. So I've now got a uh, nice objects with properties available that I can sort on, I can filter on, and it's going to be a lot easier now for, for me to gather these things that I'm interested in.
So uh, yeah, Kat's right. You know, having lived through doing this stuff really quite manually with with brittle scripts, this is a this is a much nicer way for us to live. And I I think the other tool that we should probably discuss at the same time here then would be um, let's just back up a page here. Sorry, I want to take you guys to the, uh, there we go, the policy analyzer. The policy analyzer makes it a lot easier for me to begin to answer the question of, you know, who has access to what in the organization. And again, I, this is a tool that's been made really quite easy for us to use. So let me give you just kind of a really quick example of the sorts of things that we might look for using a tool like Policy Analyzer. I'm just gonna create a custom query here, but you may have noticed there were actually a number of pre-built queries available for me uh, on that first page. What I can do is just say, you know, what, what principles or what resources or what IAM roles am I interested in and kind of gather information about how they're being used in the environment. So for instance, I have a, I have a user that I've set up as a service account. So let's just look for a principle here. And I think I've got demo in the name of that service account. So I can find that service account and just say, okay, show me stuff about that service account. I'm going to run this query and I can see the roles that they've been granted. And actually as a, as a compliance person now, sorry about that. There we go. As a compliance person, you know, I'm a little bit nervous when I see admin in a role that's been granted to a service account. So that's something that I'm definitely going to go back and ask some questions about, but I can really easily see the roles that have been associated with this particular account. And if I want to look at kind of a mapping of what can this account do with this resource, then it's really just as simple as adding something like, well, what resources? I know I've got some um, compute resources here. I did the HashiCat demo, so we'll just try that compute resource. And I'm going to get that direct mapping now between that user and that resource. And again, I see my problem. I've, this service account is a compute admin here. That's probably not appropriate in this environment. So it's definitely something I would want to ask about. But again, Google has given us a history here. So not only can I see that this exists, but if I want to look at the binding a little bit more closely, I can see the actual policy that's being applied here. And all oh, the angels rejoiced. I also can see a history of this. So I can see every change that's been made to this policy and exactly the differences each time through there. And I've got to tell you, for me, this is, this is one of those brilliant things. So Kat, do you have anything else that you would uh, like to, uh, to yeah. say there? I don't want to pop your bubble. You're, you're, <laughs> you're, you're in too much awe over this. I, I do... <laughs> I do have to <clears throat> maybe set a little, um, um, maybe take you down a notch a little bit of the capabilities <laughs> of cool. Um, you know, you can you can absolutely query and say, you know, this service account. Tell me all of the policy bindings that it has. Um, so what it's going to do is it's going to enumerate through all of the possible attachment points for the policy bindings. So those attachment points are at that org level, folder level, <laughs> project level, and resource level, right? So you can set a scope. Tell me from the project level down. So it'll look from, you know, what permissions is it possibly granted at the, at the project level? What permissions is it possibly granted at the resource level? And then it'll serve that up to you. And you can look at the, the JSON policy binding in the history. What it can't possibly do is look at other organizations, right? So it's not possible to say, what are all of the permissions granted to that service account within the scope of all of Google Cloud? Um, because Google Cloud is um, based off of resource-based permissions. 
So you don't say, you don't provide permissions to that service account. You attach them to resources. Resources can live in many, many thousands of attachment points, not in your organization. Um, so you got to understand that scope, which you're querying for. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's a, a real problem when I've got the view of what can I see here? <laughs> it doesn't tell me what's happening, you know, potentially outside what's visible to me. And this is a, this is a constant problem that we deal with as compliance folks, really trying to understand what capabilities a principal has, who might be able to access something that this is not ever just a trivial question for us to answer, but the policy history, you got to give me that. That is stinking awesome. <laughs> you know, so, okay. So we're, we're coming close to the end of our time. I do have, you know, a little bit more compliance that I want to talk to you about. I know we get a little over-focused on things like benchmarks. In fact, Kat and I had a, had a nice discussion about this yesterday, but there are some really just kind of basic hygienic things that we need to be looking for in the organizations. And, and, and those are often well spelled out in the benchmark. So I want to make sure that you understand the tools that are available to you and the, the various things that we would be able to gather as compliance folks. I guess I just wouldn't feel like it was a complete live stream if I didn't talk a little bit about some of those sorts of things that, uh, that we could measure. And a lot of those are going to be available to us through the CLI. Since we've already talked a little bit about kind of, you know, converting data, I'll give you a little bit longer command here. If I were concerned about inappropriate ingress rules, I want to make sure that you're not allowing Secure Shell or RDP into any of your compute instances. This is one of those early things I'm going to look for in a lot of environments. Then uh, I've got in the G Cloud CLI, the compute firewall rules list command. Now I'm going to go ahead and make that into a PowerShell object. So I'm going to let that run here. And it's a little bit ugly. It's a little bit difficult to see. But what happened is I've now got this PowerShell object that has a list of the rules that are enabled on the firewall for, for this particular network. And inside this, I've got this property called allowed. Now that's going to be an array or a list of the rules that are actually allowed in the environment. So I can grab that and take a look at on my ingress rules. Sorry about that. On my ingress rules, well, what, which ports are allowed? And let's go ahead and take a look at the protocols with them as well. So this is one of the things that we might do as a benchmark check. And I would want to go back and look at the rules that are allowing some of these ports that feel a little bit overly permissive here. Very, very easy for us to do. A lot of those things in the benchmark, the, the commands are going to be spelled out for you. I just want you to know that they are available to you. And it's really pretty easy for us to process that data if we would like to. In fact, here, I used this as an example earlier while Kat was talking. If I wanted to see all of my storage buckets, then I could just do an LS command against those storage accounts. And I can see the buckets that we've got set up here. And I can pretty easily check the permissions on those. So let's do an IAM get on that, see what permissions we have set up on just one of the buckets. I'll take just the very first one. And then I want to take a look at those IAM bindings that we were talking about earlier. Can I see what's been attached to this object? And in particular, I'm looking for a special group here called all users. And I really don't want to see all users with access to my bucket normally. And you can see actually in this case, we do have that as a bit of a problem. So I've got all users has been given the role of legacy bucket reader. That means everybody has at least read access on this particular resource. Now, obviously, there's a lot of other stuff like that that we could measure. And we, we didn't spend as much time in this stream on measurements because we really wanted to talk a little bit more about philosophy and about 
some of the things that are available to us. So uh, we're pretty close to time to wrap it up here. Kat, I'm going to give you any last word that you would like before we go. Um, well, I think that, you know, to all our auditors, compliance folks, um, people doing assessments against Google Cloud, I think, you know, the, the, the key thing to remember when working in this environment is the hierarchy is always with you, like the force. The hierarchy is always with you. Um, it is always there to um, push down policy. Um, the, that inheritance model is strong. Um, so, you know, always, always be aware that it is, it is with you and um, is, is there for, for good and for evil. I think that's a perfect place to leave it. Kat, thank you so much. Everybody who was attending today, thank you for, for being here. We really appreciate you taking some time with us. It was nice to, to talk to everyone today. Thank you.